Good morning. Good morning. Before I say a phrase that might very well become a bit too familiar, we will continue to say it, but I wanted to preface our greeting or the extension of our greeting, the promise and affirmation that God is with us. Before we say that together, I wanted to share something that has weighed me down through the night. And I do so because I think what we are celebrating today and why we are gathered is intimately connected to what has happened, namely as a response and a need of this world. Some of you will be familiar with the news from yesterday about an 18-year-old young man who internalized racist beliefs and carried them out in a violent manner and killed 10 people in a predominantly black neighborhood in Buffalo, New York. He drove 200 miles and shot 13 people, killing 10, in a clearly racially motivated act of violence and terrorism. There has been violence throughout this last week, and of course, too many weeks before that. And I know it is so important for us to be who we are because those messages are continually pumped out and they are being filtered and given to young and old alike. And lest we take too much comfort in the fact that that's a different country, I've been here long enough to see things that are troubling close to home in this country and in this province, even in this city. We have work to do, and we are here to do that work. Liturgy means the work of the people. So when we gather on Sundays, that's why we're really here. Yes, it's to see each other, it's to see faces, faces that I'm seeing for the first time, voices I've heard, but it is also to strengthen one another for the work that involves the transformation of this world. It is why we celebrate giving, and it is why we commit ourselves daily and weekly to the task that is before us. So as we say the phrase that we say every Sunday, I wanted us to hear it with that inflection. It is not a simple and sweet thing to say. It is urgent. And we need to be reminded that we are accompanied as we seek to do the work that is required of all people of faith in this time. So I would invite you now to join with me in saying it. God is with us. And all the time, I am thankful for you. I'm thankful to meet people for the first time and perhaps for the 60th time. <laughs> I'm thankful to see everybody who is here today. And uh, I'm also thankful that the weather uh, has uh, allowed me to venture out and play in the yard and walk around a bit. Um, I don't typically walk out with this many layers anymore. And uh, so perhaps over the summer, I might take a break from some of those extra layers if I have your permission to do so. Uh, <laughs> but before we acknowledge the territories on this Proudfoot Sunday, um, I did want to draw your attention to some things in our bulletin. I don't want you to forget these points. They are significant. Um, and it involves giving our time and talent surveys, which just helps us to see how you would like to give, commit, and share. I love to shine a light and lift up everybody. And so if you're willing to be lifted up and supported, just let us know so we can do that. And, uh, and you'll get to share all that you have to bring. I tell people constantly that our community is an embarrassment of riches. 
Those riches are not to be kept to ourselves, of course, but to be shared with all freely for the transformation of our communities. I also want to draw your attention to the mention of uh, ArcAid. We are starting a meal serve once a month, along with other churches in the London area. We are creating teams of volunteers, eight to ten persons, who are invited to share a meal that has been prepared already and to fellowship and help the staff both lay out and put up what is required for that meal. The weather is warmer, but just because it's not as cold as it was when we were providing a refuge for the unhoused, people still need to eat. One of my favorite authors, Fyodor Dostoevsky, uh, used to say many, many years ago, (laughs) one cannot live on bread alone, but one does need bread. And so we are here in part to provide uh, different kinds of bread, including that kind that you put in your mouth and it gives you uh, a full feeling for a little bit. So um, I would invite you to contact Allison. Uh, Not only the May 25th, I do think we have our team set for May, but we're gonna be doing this every month. So we need a team for June and July and hopefully build a nice rotation. It's an opportunity to hang out with people uh, doing the things that we are called to do. You'll also notice that just below the call for the volunteer opportunity to do a meal serve, um, there are specific items of need. And so if those things are lying around or you come across them, those are things that are, uh, you are able to drop them off at First Baptist just down the road. So I wanted to draw that to your attention. I also want to lift up our White Squirrel Golf Day. I don't swing a club nearly as well as our brother David Knoppert, uh, but I will be there to make merry and celebrate those who are good at swinging clubs and to just fellowship and uh, enjoy seeing and participating in something that I've heard about um, but have not had a chance to engage with just yet. I also want to lift up that uh, our Bible study, which has been a truly fulfilling part of the ministry here so far, um, it'll be on pause until September. We're taking a little break. People are going in different directions. And next Friday, I'll be heading out um, to Winnipeg to spend some time with First Nations communities and sites of remembrance there as we continue to seek to be a reparative community as we develop strategies and practices that will build relationship and strengthen covenant. With that being said, I'm going to now provide an alternative land acknowledgement once more, and thanks goes to Barry Evans for this. I invite you to listen to these words, learn from them, and live into them. The land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Atawandran, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Lunapiwa peoples who have long-standing relationships to the land, water, and region of southwestern Ontario. Before settlers came, the indigenous peoples upheld a dish with one spoon treaty. The dish represents the land that is to be shared peacefully, and the spoon represents the individuals living on and using the resources of the land in a spirit of mutual cooperation. This covenant was honored then among First Nations peoples and is to be honored today with all who inhabit and use these lands.
radiance, and warmth divine. We are invited this hour by a flame that has burned for eons. This flame was carried forward by our ancestors and the faith, and it has been passed down to us for the purpose of transforming the world. Today, as we honor the flame bearers among us, renew our strength so that we might continue to shine our light for the world to see. I would invite you all now to join with me in our call to worship, which is taken from Psalm 148 and inspired St. Francis's familiar canticle to the creatures. Alleluia, praise Yahweh from the heavens. Praise God, all you angels, all you host. Praise Yahweh from the earth, you sea creatures and ocean depths. Praise God, all mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars. Praise God, all animals and all cattle, small animals and all birds. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let us pray. Loving God, in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name echoes through the universe. Gift us with discernment and resolve so that your light would shine into all the dark areas of our world. Grace us with affirmation and support as we encounter obstacles too difficult to surmount without others' help. May the faith of those who have given so much inspire us to do likewise this day and every day. Amen.
<laughs> Good morning. How's it going? Y'all look so great. Yeah, I love the dresses. Very nice. Perfect. Well, is it summer yet? <laughs> it feels kind of like it to me. How's school going? Yeah? Everybody's probably getting ready for the big month of June. I know there's some big days coming up. So what, do you remember what I've talked about in the last couple of weeks when we've come up here? Family? Does that, I know, right? You've had a few days and a few nights of sleep since then. You remember saying something about family, how you have your families, right? Like your sister, your aunts, your uncles, your parents, okay, grandparents. But you also have a church family, right? And in Sunday school, I know that one of the things that we've talked about or has been talked about, I haven't been able to be there, unfortunately, but has been our family that we see in the Bible and the stories in the Bible, from Abraham down through all of the children and people that came after. And so today, I want to lift up a couple that you might talk about, Jacob and Esau. Do you know about Jacob and Esau? You do? Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's where your dad gets his name from. That's right. Jacob and Esau were brothers, twins even. They were really close, but one came before the other, just barely. Actually, in the Bible, do you know what it reads? Jacob was actually holding on to the ankle of Esau because he did not want Esau to come out before him because in their time, if you came out, even if it was just a second earlier, you got everything. But if you were second, you kind of had to do basically what the older brother wanted to do. So, for example, whenever um, the parents, you know, deceased or they left things to their children, right, it was only the oldest son that got to have everything. And so that was Esau. How do you think Jacob felt about that arrangement? <laughs> <laughs> he probably wasn't very happy about it, nor would we be, right? And so Jacob kind of did some things that um, took advantage of Esau because Jacob was really trying to get an advantage because he knew that Esau kind of had everything coming for him. Do you know Jacob one time tricked Esau into giving him his birthright? And what that meant was Whatever you're going to inherit is actually going to be mine, right? That's what Jacob tried to do. And it was for something almost kind of silly, we would think, right? It was for stew. Esau was so hungry, he had been out hunting, and he said, I'll give you whatever, basically, okay? So Jacob did a lot of things, and it made Esau upset, and it got Jacob in a lot of trouble. Have you ever done anything that might have upset your sister? Yeah? Yeah? I did things that upset my brother all the time. So I had a brother who was two and a half years younger than me. And like, I just felt it was my duty to kind of make him up, you know, pick on it. I'm sorry, I confessed. I've asked for forgiveness. But I wasn't always the nicest. Um, but we, we reconciled. We're brothers. But we did argue a little bit. And I think every set of siblings probably argues. But you know what? Family works through whatever difficulties come up. That's the same thing that happens for us as a church. There are arguments, there are disagreements, we don't all think the same, but that's not why we're here. Do you know how small we would be if you had to think the same to be here? <laughs> I don't know how many people would be here, not many, one, thank you, that's perfect. There'd be one person, because <laughs> nobody thinks exactly like anybody else. But today, you're gonna be talking about ways that we can build our family up and strengthen them, even though you don't think the same and you have conflicts and arguments sometimes, not just with your sister or with your brother, but with everybody that you consider part of your family, okay? So go ahead and say a prayer with me, and then you're going to go off and talk a little bit more about that. Loving God, we thank you for family, for all our family, not just those with whom we live, but for our family here at First St. Andrews and beyond. We know that it is not always easy 
to get along, that we have disagreements, we have arguments, but we know, God, that if we trust in you and look to you, you will mend our relationships and you will help us to grow closer together and to support one another through acts of love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, I appreciate that. Our scripture reading this morning is from the Acts of the Apostles as recorded by St. Luke, chapter 11, verses 1 to 18. And it's titled, Peter's Report to the Church at Jerusalem. Acts 11, beginning at verse 1. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced, and they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. For the word of God in Scripture, among us and within us, Thanks be to God.
from, or I should say our second reading from the Christian scriptures, because both of our readings today come from the Christian scriptures. The first, of course, from the Acts of the Apostles. The second is from Revelation. And it connects with our reading from last week. And as I like to preface the book of Revelation, we are called to hear not just some of the frightening images that maybe some of us were raised with or get conjured up when we hear the word revelation or the book of revelation, but there are words of comfort for God's people, people who are in distress and who are experiencing persecution. Our reading today comes from chapter 21, the first six verses. Oh, and I wanted to ask, even though it isn't the gospel, like I did last week, I do like to give those who are in need of a break a little moment to stretch, since we're not as engaged just yet coming out of the pandemic. If you need to kind of stand up and move around a little bit, I want you to feel free to do that. So no obligation, but feel free. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for the husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them, and they will be God's peoples, and God will be with them. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. And also the one said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then God said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Here ends our reading. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated if you want. Let us pray. Holy Word that comes to us this spring, a source of new life, be with us now in this hour and in all hours to come, in our hearts, in our minds, and always in our actions. Amen. The reading from the book of Acts and Peter's witness before those who were in Jerusalem gives us a window into an understanding of contagion, something we can understand now, not unlike they understood in the first century. There were beliefs around contamination, and those beliefs were even instituted as policy with regards to certain cities that effectively became leper colonies. We know that the early church in its origins pushed against some of those practices and beliefs, and yet they were still first century persons, just like we are <laughs> 21st century persons, and we have our own beliefs, as did they, around 
what causes contamination, what causes harm, what weakens or strengthens us. And so Peter, apparently, we know this from chapters just prior to Paul's reading today, Peter had entered the home of a Gentile, a Gentile who most certainly would not have had a kosher kitchen, a Gentile who most certainly would not have engaged in acts of ritual cleansing that would have ensured Peter could enter that space and not be contaminated. I know this might seem a little odd on the surface, but I can remember, and I'm not that old, being told by my parents, and yes, grandparents, when I went certain places, to watch where I sit, what I touch, to even be mindful of who I spent too much time with. Because at least in the minds of my family, contamination was not just a microbacterial phenomenon. It involved the kind of social and political realm, just like it did in the first century. Now, to be fair, I think there's ample evidence to say that our notions of contagion and contamination are rooted in our bodies. They are evolutionary mechanisms that work to preserve us, to keep us alive. We are to avoid certain things, and that is written into our cellular codes. We know bodily when and perhaps what to stay away from as do other creatures as well. And yet, over time, those, we'll call them acts of aversion, become translated into cultural practices. Just like many materially grounded practices become translated into policy and practice at the social level. So Peter has entered into an unconsecrated space and perhaps made himself unclean. So he has called forward and said, hey, how can you account for making yourself, for entering into a space and becoming contaminated? I mean, what do you have to say for yourself? And Peter, of course, gives an account of the vision, not only a vision that he had, but a vision of the person whose home he entered. It is a vision that, of course, we believe is gifted of God. And it actually speaks to something that I believe changes in this first century discourse. I say that with a caveat. It changes, but maybe not fully or completely. You see, discourses of contamination continue to recur, sometimes out of necessity, as with public policy protocols that were put into place to protect our communities during the COVID pandemic. But it also gets put into place in things that we would find objectionable. In my previous context of the United States, we know there were lines that kept some people in some places and others in other places. And the same was true in Canada. In fact, during February, Black History Month, I had the privilege of learning about Lincoln Alexander and what he had experienced and what he contributed. But I also learned that when he was in the Royal Canadian Air Force, he was denied access to a bar. He and some of his colleagues, uh, they had invited him to join them, and uh, he was prohibited from entering. And he ultimately left the military, and that motivated him to do something about that unfair policy. And that wasn't that long ago. Some of you even got to meet Lincoln Alexander before his death. And so you can see, and you probably know about them in your own life, numerous instances where language around contamination 
and cleanliness and purity unfortunately get translated into practices that are not about the biological realm, but about the social, the political, the cultural. There are discourses of division that increase stratification, they sow seeds of hate and resentment, and they manifest in acts of violence, like the one that I mentioned earlier. I'm gonna take you quickly to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15. Verse 11, the gospel writer has Jesus say, you have been concerned about what you take into your body. You thought that what you took in defiled you, but it's actually the other way around. It's what leaves your mouth that defiles you. It's your actions in the world that contaminates you. It is your activity or inactivity that creates these unfortunate things that leaves you in the so-called contaminated state. You see, prior to this practice, almost everyone assumed that being in certain places meant that things could be transferred to you in a rather mysterious manner and it was better to be safe, and so you might say they overcorrect. Jesus changes that. And in fact, the early Christians, first and second century, are written about through scathing reports and accounts because they went into places that no one else would go into. They spoke to people that no one else would speak to. They welcomed people into their midst that no one else would welcome. That was how the Christian church was known. They tended to those who had leprosy. They welcomed widows, orphans, and strangers into their midst. In fact, the ecclesia, the early body of belief, the reason they were known and ridiculed was because they received those persons that had been denied access to the first ecclesia, the Greek ecclesia, that body of democracy that we often lift up nostalgically. You see, the church turned that on its head just as Jesus turns discourses of contamination on their head. Now listen, I do not intend to promote reckless behavior. We understand how biological contamination works. However, we also know how that language can quickly be co-opted and weaponized, and it creates discord and division. Skin color varies. We know throughout, variances in skin color have affected that discourse. We know that notions of contamination, intermarriage between different faiths, different languages, different religious systems, different beliefs, different ways of being have caused discord and tumult, not only in the church, but throughout societies. So as much as we would like to believe that we are far removed from the crises that Peter found himself in time and again, I would encourage you to pause and think about ways in which our practices at times can be just as alienating and concerning in terms of the divisions that they foster. But I also want to say that is precisely why we continue to come together. That is why we do work together. That is why we encourage giving so that we can aspire and live into a world where those discourses no longer affect human relationships in such a terrible, negative, violent manner. We strive for a world in which all are welcomed. We are an affirming congregation. Broadly understood, that means there is nothing short of violence or harm threatened to one of our members Nothing beyond that that would keep you 
from full participation in the life of this community. That is a bold step. And do you know that is a step that only three United Church congregations have committed to make at this point? There are others in process, and we give thanks to God for that. So I lift that up. The ministry of First St. Andrews has been and will continue to be a ministry of radical welcome and hospitality because that is what we are called to do. That is what we see written. We understand the origins of that contamination. We know that it is what comes out of our mouth that creates problems for us as a church and as a people. And that if we focus on that, and think about the way we interact with each other, this will once again become that space of refuge for our sisters and brothers who are in London and beyond who need that kind of place, who need a balm to heal the wounds of trauma that they have experienced in their life because they have not felt welcomed in all places. I lift up those in our community who have given for so many years, those who have given of their time, their resources, their energy, their talent, because it is not simply for the sake of our church that those gifts are made, but for the salvation of the world, for the transformation of this world. Now, that might mean different things to different people, but I think we can all agree that at the very least what that means is that a world in which all are welcomed, all are supported, all have enough, all have clothes, all have shelter. We won't stop until that happens. That is the kingdom of God for which we pray, for which we work, and into which we are called to live. I invite you to hear those words of Jesus, those words of Luke in the Acts of the Apostles today, regarding what is clean and what is unclean, who is unclean, I want you to hear those words again so that it permeates your activity, so that it permeates your week, and it strengthens you so that you might be able to offer that blessing of welcome and hospitality to everyone that you meet, regardless of condition. Amen.
I would like to invite everyone now to consider ways in which our lives can even be more welcoming, more enveloping, the same way that God's love has been and continues to be for us. Whatever is getting in the way of that radical welcome, of that unconditional acceptance, I pray that we would leave that behind and would be strengthened to do so by the spirit that has brought us together today. Let us pray. <clears throat> Holy One, we gather on this fifth Sunday of Easter hungry for your presence with us and hopeful for the Spirit's breath to fill us. We exhale exhaustion and fear. We long to follow the path of the one who always calls to us, but we fear the cost of this decision. We trust what has been revealed to us, but do not trust our ability to articulate it. Restore our confidence in your love for us and encourage us to throw off the inner critic, the naysayer within, so that we might join with the chorus of saints that have gone before us. Before us, behind us, above us, and below us, you are where we need you, O oh God, at all times. Grant us the courage this day to live as we are called and to pray as our teacher has showed us, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We speak of offering, and we give thanks for the opportunity to reflect and consider what it is we are being called to share so that this world might know the love that we know and are claimed by. From that which is familiar to those that we do not know, from the abundance that resides to the need that emerges, now is the time to become our faith. <laughs>
For the blessing of this and all our days, we give thanks. May this offering of thanksgiving presented fill the bodies and minds of our sisters and brothers, both near and far. May what has been given carry the blessing of agape to those who receive. Amen. Good morning. I'm Paul Cooper, co-chair with Jackie Williams of the Board of Trustees of First St. Andrews. And it gives me great pleasure this morning to introduce to you the newest members of the Proudfoot Society. But before I do that, I'd like to give you some background. In, 19, in 2020, the long-term giving committee of the Board of Trustees launched a new benefactor program that they called the Proudfoot Society to commemorate the role of the Reverend William Proudfoot in establishing congregations back when London was described as a grim little village. Perhaps some things never change. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Proudfoot arrived in London, Ontario, in November of uh, 1832 from Presbyterian Scotland, and he worked tirelessly from then on until his death in 1851 to establish congregations, helping them to raise funds to build and maintain their churches. There is a wonderful history, if you're interested, that was written by a member of our congregation, Gavin McGregor, entitled The Reverend William Proudfoot, An Old Acquaintance. It was published in 2011, and he writes of the society in which Proudfoot played such a prominent role. Our Board of Trustees is committed to continuing those traditions of generosity and service by offering opportunities for you and others to contribute to the long-term sustainability of First St. Andrews through membership in the Proudfoot Society. This morning, I should like to acknowledge the huge debt of gratitude that we all owe to John Eberhardt, the chair of the Long-Term Giving Committee, who has done yeoman's service along with his fellow trustees to craft this program, improve it, support it, and bring it to fruition. Before the Proudfoot Society existed, First St. Andrews benefited enormously from legacies left to the church by members in their wills. The Proudfoot Society was designed to recognize living donors who wish uh, to, that First St. Andrews would benefit uh, immediately from funds that are placed in the Proudfoot Legacy Trust Funds. But an immediate donation is only one of the ways to be recognized. Individuals and families become members by making a pledge to remember First St. Andrews in their wills or through other means, such as an insurance policy with an end-of-life bequest. The considerable investment income from all of First St. Andrews endowment funds is an ongoing gift that ensures the sustainability of our church, gifts that truly keep on giving. This is very necessary income for our church. We can no longer afford to cover our annual operating budget from weekly congregational offerings, and income from those trust funds ensures that we can meet this shortfall and continue to run our programs and serve our community as we meet our Christian responsibility. Without our trust funds, our ability to maintain the level of staffing and provide the resources to run the kinds of programs that make our church such a wonderful place would be curtailed severely. But I want to stress that the Proudfoot Society isn't just about giving money. Many of us are no longer or never were in a financial position to give large sums to the church. But First St. Andrews would be lost without the incredible long and dedicated service of so many individuals. We also recognize these individuals with induction into the society. People who have been First St. Andrews members for 40 years or more, and who in addition have served in such leadership capacities as chairs of either council or the trustees or the United Church women are honored as Proudfoot Society members. 
All of this is well outlined in the pamphlet that is available uh, in the bulletin, in the pews, sorry, in the pews this morning. It is my great privilege today to acknowledge the individuals sitting in the front pews and who are the newest inductees to the Proudfoot Society. We had really hoped that this year uh, we could have a proper party after service today. However, while we are all very much through with COVID, the virus isn't through with us. Two of our inductees, uh, the Hendries, uh, are, one of them is down with COVID and can't be here this morning. So uh, it's still out there. Uh, perhaps next year. In closing, I should like to highlight and thank on behalf of my fellow trustees the extraordinary generosity shown by all of these individuals, a generosity of time and talents, of care and money. To each of you, we owe an enormous debt of gratitude and our appreciation. Thank you for believing in First St. Andrews. By enhancing our Proudfoot Legacy Trusts, you are ensuring that First St. Andrews goes forward sustainably for generations to come, which should give us all a strong feeling of optimism and hope for the future. We are indeed very fortunate, and on behalf of the Board of Trustees and all of the congregation, I offer you our heartfelt thanks. And now, uh, I should like to ask the following individuals to come forward as you are able and stand here uh, to my uh, right, to your left, uh, and face the congregation to receive your award. Mr. Kerry Hill, Mr. John A. McDonald, Glenda Robinson, Bob and Debbie Schramm, and Mr. David Wardlaw. <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, they told me to embarrass you, so uh, you got to stand up front for just a minute, just playing. <laughs> so I get to say a few things about my friends who are here today, and I'm grateful to call them friends. Um, I think to Paul's comments, what's so wonderful about this is that I've gotten to know everybody that I get to talk a little bit about. Now, John, it's the first time I've gotten to see John and meet John in person, but he and I have had probably four or five conversations over the phone. And um, I'm gonna just say a little bit about each person in the order uh, that they were presented um, by Paul. And so I'll first, I'll start off with Carrie. I have a special debt of gratitude for Carrie, who was the chair of the search committee that brought me here. And I will forever be grateful to he and to Ardeth. Can't forget Ardeth, because I know without Ardeth, <laughs> there's no Carrie standing right here. Um, but I am immensely grateful for not only the years of sacrifice and service, uh, but for the care and the compassion that he continues to exhibit. Um, it is no small thing to do something like that for so long. And uh, I know that I speak with FSA in saying thank you to my brother, Kerry Hill, for all that he has done and continues to do. He hasn't stopped. So that is a good thing. Um, I also want to lift up, though they are not here, uh, my brother and sister Jan and Jim Hendry. Jan was on the search committee that brought me here. So again, <laughs> selfishly, I'm deeply grateful uh, to Jan, um, and not only for her work and the tireless hours that were spent on that search committee, but for the care and the compassion and the love uh, that she has exhibited time and again along with Jim. Uh, she never tires of checking on me, making sure I'm taking care of myself, and there are a number of you who do that. For that, I am grateful. Um, and I know that my mother is grateful, my wife is grateful, uh, many people and my kids are grateful uh, that you do such a great job. And so uh, to Jan and Jim, um, they are a source of vitality. They help to build this community up, and I believe they embody fully um, what we try to um, celebrate with the Proudfoot Society. To John and Lou Ann, 
his late wife. I know that John has shared with me that Lou Anne is the saint <laughs> and that he followed the saint. Um, but I know that there is more to that story, part of which has been filled in by John. I know it's just fragments, but John has been a lifelong committed member at FSA. He and Luann have served in a variety of capacities, including board chair, chair of trustees, you name it, they've probably done it. I don't have a list long enough to enumerate that, but I think most people who are here today probably realize that, and if you didn't before, now you know. Uh, additionally, John has supported the Proudfoot Legacy Trust as well, and he said, and this is something I took from John, John doesn't do this for recognition. I know he's grateful, but he does it because he wants the work of the church to continue. John has thought big. John thinks about the church years beyond our own years, and I celebrate his commitment and his inspiration, his witness and example for all of us. We are to participate in a time to which we do not belong and will not belong, but which those we love will belong. And so I am grateful to John and Luann for Glenda, my friend, educator, supporter of both Proudfoot Legacy and just tireless hours. I have seen Glenda since I've been here in many different capacities because I think Glenda is one of those persons that has numerous skills and abilities, but she also just steps in where she's needed. Um, she shares, she lifts up, she edifies, and she brings what I consider a certain kind of spice and creativity to various activities, which I'm very excited about. Paul mentioned we can't do a celebration, a party. My Jewish friends would always say at Passover, next year, Jerusalem. So next year, a party, right? We'll throw a big party, and that's my hope too. Um, but I am thankful to Glenda, also her service on the executive of the UCW, faithful membership over 40 years. Um, her efforts are truly generative, and so I say thank you personally to Glenda. Bob and Debbie Schramm, who keep me laughing and on my toes. <laughs> they are committed in ways that can be named and yet ways that are unnamed. Uh, not only have they checked on me, and cared for me, but they have checked on countless persons. They have supported the Proudfoot Legacy Trust as well as the entire community of First St. Andrews with their lifetime commitment to this community. They know that their work, their giving, goes to support our work and that our city needs it, our region needs it, our country needs it, and um, they do make me laugh, and that is not an under I, that is not to be underappreciated uh, because laughter is great medicine, and uh, they both bring a tremendous amount of perspective and talent uh, for whatever needs arise. So personally, I say thank you to Deb and Bob. And finally, to Margaret and David. Margaret is recovering right now, thanks be to God. Um, it was an unexpected event from which she is recovering uh, but we are grateful for her recovery. David has communicated to me that our sister is in good spirits, and um, I can say to both of them that they, like those who are standing here today, have gone a long ways to making sure that I am cared for, that the ministry that we are all engaged in is cared for and treated with respect and commitment. Um, not only have they supported the trust and they've committed in countless ways, including, you know, right now David's the chair of the church council. I hear, I haven't seen it in action, but I hear David is quite the handyman and uh, does what needs to be done whenever it needs to be done. I didn't even know David probably knows a lot more about my chemical composition than I do as well. So David, <laughs> David and Margaret bring a wealth of knowledge and ability and resources to their work here. I told you we're an embarrassment of riches, and this is just, you know, a beautiful sampling of that, but I say thank you to both Margaret and David for being not only generous, but creative and loving and compassionate. I will say just a special thing, um, being from the United States, when we say Thanksgiving, a different date comes to mind, uh, and I've learned, I'm, I'm on board now. I got to celebrate both of them this year. Uh, but David and Margaret kindly invited us over, since Margaret herself is also from the States. So they had a little celebration for us in November, 
and I will not forget that. I am immensely grateful. And so I celebrate everybody here, the level of commitment, service, and the compassion in which they walk and they live, and uh, I hope it's okay to ask that we give them a hand for what they've done. So. Thanks for that, Don. You took over the task that I was a little nervous about, so you're doing that penning, so <laughs> I'm glad you're doing it, not me. I'm always afraid I'm going to poke somebody. So. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. celebrate and to be inspired despite the terrible news that it seems like we view daily I give thanks for those of us who continue to gather and affirm that God is with us and inspiring us to change this world so that there will be no more no more violence no more exclusion we are working for that beloved community and in that spirit, I invite you to both receive and offer our closing blessing. The light of God's